All right, this is InfoSec Decoded number 58, humans. What are they good for? And uh, we're starting with Irvin saying somebody actually recalled something because of bad security. Uh, yes, uh, a couple cell phones are being recalled uh, because of some defect where they send paid SMS messages to short numbers. That's not what you'd normally call a defect. That's more like deliberate like fraud and, and malware and stuff. Yeah, but that's how they're wording it. That's sort of uh, like the Tesla defect where it plows right into emergency vehicles. Right, right. You yeah. could put it that way. You could totally put it that way, and that's how they're putting it. But uh, has, so, have they been selling it for like two years? Yes. For the past two years, those, those two specific phones from a company called DNS has been, uh, uh, they're recalling those, those phones, two years. So all that time, these phones have been sending messages to someone you're paying for, and, and they, nobody complained? Or... Nobody complained, nobody noticed, and then a, uh, a Russian researcher realized it, and now they're like, oops, sorry. Well, oh. <laughs> I, I feel like we might not have the whole story there. Yeah, we probably don't. Yeah, all right. And Alan has got Siri and Google listening. Yeah, this is an interesting story, not because of any great revelations about Siri or Alexa doing anything any more nefarious than they've already been confirmed to be doing, but there is at least one major lawsuit and there are multiple other lawsuits that are trying to become a class action lawsuit in which the plaintiffs allege that um, Apple with Siri, Google with Alexa, uh, have each respectively been uh, violating the law by collecting too much data from their voice helpers. And um, the specifics are rather vague at this point, but What's going to be interesting in these lawsuits is that by filing these uh, lawsuits, perhaps turning into a class action, and then by filing a number of discovery motions, they may be shaking the trees enough so that some real information falls out of it. Uh, the court may well force the companies to divulge quote unquote proprietary information or protected information. and. Uh, through the discovery process, maybe we'll just come to discover that maybe Apple and Siri, Apple with Siri and uh, Amazon with with Alexa, have indeed been um, uh, violating their own rules and violating the privacy. Oh well, well this is just a continuation of what we've been hearing about for years. This is not new. Well, that's just a challenge for their e-discovery company. That is the whole point. You're not supposed to be ad admitting to other crimes when responding to discovery orders. Right, right, yes. But, you know, I was just thinking about this the other day. That, uh, once again, some of the ads on my phone were very pertinent to things I had talked about. And I've been hearing that for years. Yeah. And, you know, these are things that I don't usually talk about. And these are also ads that I don't usually see on my phone. So um, one does wonder. Well, you know, I, I always, when someone told me that like years ago, I thought it would be pretty easy to test. You could like have students, the typical, uh, you know, servants used for these things and give them like a list of random words to read and then like scan their, their spam to see if they get spammed on that. And like have another group that does that, but like put their phone in another room or something for the control group, it wouldn't be that hard to do a controlled experiment. Right. And I know there have been multiple studies that have attempted to do just this, and they've all come back empty pretty much. Um, and right. Yeah. Which, which literally suggests that it's all just user error, right? People say, I never thought about that except when I talked about it yesterday, but that's not really true. They apparently clicked on a link about it or something. Right. Right. Something along those lines. Uh, and yet, uh, maybe the reality and perception um, don't necessarily need to align for this to be an issue. Well, you know, there's another thing too, which is I think people are a whole lot more predictable than they imagine. You know. Yes. I, I was going to say there's there's I remember this old story, and this was from years ago, where 
um, a father got really upset because Target was sending his daughter um, things about pregnancy stuff like, oh, you know, like, what about a baby? Do you need like pregnancy gear and all this stuff? And the father's like, my daughter is like 16. How dare you send that stuff? Uh, but it turns out what Target was doing was, was they were analyzing her shopping habits and she didn't buy anything particular about, you know, being pregnant, uh, but just random things about the way she was shopping the, the algorithm figured she might be interested in baby stuff soon. And um, sure enough, yeah, she was pregnant. She didn't tell her father. Um, and that's how, that's how the father found out was through, you know, these targeted ads years ago. And so our, our subtle behaviors we don't even think about uh, can be correlated. Um, and there are people working day and night to figure out exactly how to best target ads based on like random behaviors we do or random things we click on um, that have nothing to do with or seemingly have anything to have nothing to do with with what um, what we really want or what we will want. And now in the era of machine learning, the computers are doing that. So there may be no human anywhere that can explain how it is that your purchase of bananas and applesauce meant you were pregnant. You know, some machine learning thing figured this out. Anyway. All right. Well, uh, and then I, this one, I, I've been following. So the Texas passed this anti-abortion law and the part where you can snitch on your neighbor and get $10,000 for turning in people who are helping your neighbor get an abortion is so much fun. They set up a website so you can rat on your neighbor and there's a huge backlash. So GoDaddy said, oh, we don't want your business. Get out of here and kicked them off. So they went to Epic which is run by the guy that runs the American Nazi party website. He's like in Washington, DC, he's famous for being the, the American, he's Rob Monster. He runs the hosting that will not kick you off for being a lunatic. And even the Epic kicked them off. Even the Nazis can't stand these guys. So I was telling my friends, you know, I think, I think they'll go to the Russians and that's what they did. They went to where the uh, 3% and the Alliance Defending Freedom who are the people that crafted this law are. And those people go through a British shell company to Crimea, which is controlled by the Russians. So now they are indeed hosted by the Russians, which is where this all comes from anyway. I think pretty much all of what we call the alt-right is uh, Russian propaganda. <laughs> anyway, so it's, uh, it's quite appropriate. That's the people that will not kick them off. And so people can be posting like their idea that their, friend, their neighbor might be pregnant and maybe she's gonna get an abortion and we can all get rich. So we'll see how that all turns out. It is. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, yeah. I was going to say, in my experience, um, um, vigilanceism always works out very well. Well, you know, in the Philippines, Duterte said, oh, just kill the drug dealers. It's fine. Just legalized murder. And they killed thousands of pe random people accusing them of being drug dealers. Uh, and I, I, and there was an article that just came out in the, New, in the New Yorker about Afghanistan, rural women saying this is what the Americans did. They just came in and propped up local warlords, and then they would just grab random people and tell Americans, this guy's a Taliban, kill him and give me the reward. <laughs> so same kind of thing. Anyway, and then Liz has got automated hiring. Yeah, so uh, we hear a whole lot about how there are these shortages of uh, various types of uh, workers, but a big one big issue with that is that uh, uh, the a lot of these companies are using automated hiring systems that are filtering out a lot of viable candidates just based on really um, stupid criteria and um, it seems like everybody knows this, but nobody has changed this yet. And some of the examples um, in this article were pretty hilariously stupid. Um, and, and it, 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 it included some examples of how these, um, track, these uh, systems work that are just bizarre. Uh, one of them was it just automatic, a lot of the systems automatically reject us. Anyone who has a six month gap in employment without any consideration for why, which is incredibly stupid. Uh, and I sort of wonder if it might be illegal in some ways, because uh, what if somebody was, some, what if somebody had cancer for, uh, and then their treatment took 
seven months and uh, they are automatically rejected out of the pile because of that. Now, of course, nobody can prove that stuff uh, when you're not picked for a job, but it does make you think. Um, some of the other uh, examples had to do with uh, various search terms that uh, that that these um, systems are looking for. And it doesn't matter if the applicant had skills on their resume that were synonymous with those terms, they still got rejected out of the pile if they didn't have an exact match. So. Well, you know, I've been on human hiring committees and I know how incredibly unfair and corrupt they are. And I, I know some people who actually push the automated things saying they are less bigoted than the humans. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I, I, I can see that too, but the problem is, is that these systems are built and programmed by humans with all of the implicit and explicit biases attached. So clearly so, the, the solution, like most problems, is to get all the humans out of the loop. The stuff should be programming itself with AI and you should be hiring robots as workers and then all this the problem wouldn't ha be happening. Well, we're, we're, we're working on it. That's the glorious utopia. We'll just lounge around on floating cities eating peeled grapes while robots do all the work. I'm sure that's exactly how that'll work out. That's what could go wrong? I saw it on Star Trek. Anyway. All right. So, uh, and Caitlin has got GeoCity. Yes. So the web is finally fixing itself. Um, nature finds a way, I suppose. Uh, so the debrief has an article uh, written by Eli uh, uh, Matika uh, talking about how a bunch of tech workers are upset at the modern way that we do social networking online. So I think like Facebook, Twitter, that kind of stuff. And uh, they're looking back in time to figure out a better way we can do this. Um, instead of having this giant like corporate controlled, sterilized, everyone's the same, everyone's being tracked with their data. Uh, what if we go back and have sort of a GeoCities like experience where everyone has their own personalized web page and they have a MIDI file of their favorite music playing at the top. And, you know, it's this random collection of, of people's expressions of themselves. Wouldn't it be great if we go back to that? And so that's what's happening. Um, web rings are apparently making a comeback. And, uh, and I thought this was really great because this reminds me of your website, Sam. You, you've gone full circle <laughs> where, um, where for a long time, um, you know, Sam's website was just like HTML, like straight from like the bit better than GeoCities, but still. Um, and that was seen as, and people were like, it was originally on GeoCity. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and and now and now people are coming back around and being like, no, that thing Sam does. <laughs> I mean, had people say I'm really cool because I made my website so retro, and I said, uh, yeah, let's go with that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, you know what, Sam? Um, now your website style is coming back, um, and so <laughs> and so it's come full circle. <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah, I mean, I, the fact is, I my website is exactly as good as it was in 1993. In fact, it's the same as it was in 1993. That's when I lost interest. Yeah, and well, well, that's the thing is that people are looking at all these new social media sites and they're seeing like has have things improved now that we've sort of corporatized things, made things all the same. And the answer is really no, we really haven't made things better. So let's just go back, and at least now we're not being tracked by you know, Facebook and Google and having stuff in our feed from white nationalists and stuff like that. We can just make our own GeoCities page again. Well, well, I think you are being tracked. That's why I'm actually, I was almost going to like write angry letters to people with their ads on their podcast that say, are you tired of Google tracking you? Use our VPN. And I'm like, dude, that VPN is not going to stop Google tracking you at all. <laughs> well, that's true. That's true. I mean, there will be people that will be uh, trying to find a way to associate your website to who you are, your identity, yeah. uh, and then pull off, you know, keywords and, and try to then do web tracking and figure out what websites you're going to and then target ads for you. Remember, this is what we were talking about earlier, where, where ads just suddenly know exactly what you're thinking and talking about. I mean, this is one of those ways it'll, it'll do it, but at least now it's not being in, in, in an insular um, sort of corporate environment. 
like Facebook or, or Twitter, people can be free to write terrible HTML and, you know, put dancing baby gifts on their, <laughs> on their homepage again. No, I think you're already free to do that. But anyway, all right. Not on Twitter. You can't really like make your own Twitter page and have like your own well, JavaScript running and make meteor showers come from the top of your page and stuff. I mean, well, I guess you're right. We're being oppressed and I haven't yes. realized it. We're, we're being, this is how you oppress the internet. Apparently so. Okay. Well, um, all right. And let's go back to Urban, who has got uh, Enhancing Your Privacy. So this one isn't necessarily news, but it's for those who are watching and want some tips on enhancing their browser privacy. This has a couple of things that you can do to your browser and make yourself just a little bit more safer, either by using add-ons or making changes within the browser settings itself. So how much do you, th do you think they actually do? Um, it does a lot of the basic things that we talk about in our classes or that we would just tell anybody to do. Well, what? I see deleting cookies. Yeah, deleting cookies, um, well, managing well, website data, removing history, setting up things like ghostery. I guess, but I think Google can blast through all that. <laughs> Google can blast through all that, but they also have things for Safari. They have things for Edge. They have things for Firefox and Brave. I would like to see a study whether all of that actually accomplishes anything of value to the end user. I'm very skeptical. You block Origin, which I have an article on, does does do a does do its job. Yeah, blocking Edge, I think that's good. That actually, I had to do that just because it takes so long to load Edge and everything. Yeah, yeah, that's true. yeah, that part I like. All right, I know I used to have a lot of students who would make a big deal out of manually deleting the cookies all the time, and that just seemed like a total waste of time. All right, and so Alan has got the one I mean for the title, Do We Need Humans? What good are they anyway? Indeed, and especially after the pandemic too, uh, a lot of uh, uh, businesses plan to invest in automation technology. Um, and according to an IMF survey, if I recall correctly, IMF survey, at least 40% of global businesses um, plan to increase their automation in the coming years. And uh, apparently this is part of a larger trend in um, past pandemics is that companies have historically invested in greater automation post pandemics because they realize their vulnerability to, well, human disease and loss of workers and loss of uh, output consequently. So um, this story doesn't have any big revelations in it. Uh, in some ways, this is yet another story about automation, the same kind of story about automation that we've been hearing for years, especially with the self-driving cars. Um, and yet the whole self-driving car thing is kind of fizzled out. It's certainly not dead yet, and I'm sure we will have self-driving cars in the future but all of the earlier predictions about self-driving cars being on the roads by 2020 did not materialize. And as a matter of fact, a lot of those self-driving car companies seem to be not quite dead themselves, but in serious trouble. I don't really see a lot of self-driving cars on the roads anymore. Like I've never Uber, seen one anywhere. Yeah, Uber and Cruise just have disappeared from the streets. The only car, a self-driving car company I see uh, in San Francisco now is Waymo, but everyone else is out of the game. So anyway, this story is in many ways about the meta story, meta, uh, the situation about how the coverage of automation um, appears in, in the US news media. So we might be in for another news cycle of how jobs are getting automated out. And some of it, there is an element of truth in it, but there's also an element of the hype cycle that's self-serving for various VC funded startups that are trying to attract more attention, attract more investment. And they have to burn through hundreds of millions of dollars to devise a machine that makes a pizza, for example. Yep. Well, the one thing that has happened is the checkout counters in the grocery store largely been replaced by self-checkout. 
Yeah, this is true. This is definitely more of a post-pandemic thing. As, as long as Target's had self-checkout uh, uh, machines. Now I, I've noticed other uh, retailers like um, uh, Whole Foods have gotten on that bandwagon recently. Yep. Yeah, I remember my sister always says she won't use them. She goes in the other line so a cashier can have a job. And I'm, I'm, I totally don't. I'd much rather deal with the robot. <laughs> You know, this is such a, a capitalist mindset where this idea that we have to have people have jobs that they don't want to do. They don't want to be yeah. there. They would much rather be doing something else. But yeah. how else are we supposed to give them food and give them support instead of just being like, well, we can automate your job and now you can get free money. <laughs> I know, this has bothered me all my life. I, as a president, I'm going to make more jobs. We're going to make our production less efficient so we can have like rows of people picking those cabbages or something. I said, this is what you want. This is good. How is this good? Yeah, it, it is not good. Um, it, it's just, it's a, it's a mindset, unfortunately. And, and we should be in a mindset where if we're automating things no one wants to do, we should be cheering. <laughs> but, also, but that would the thing the people should somehow be able to live without a job exactly and then we go into sort of post-capitalist post-scarcity society stuff and people are just not ready to hear about this stuff but we have to deal with it pretty soon because we've already eliminated two sectors of our economy so we have um we used to have the industrial sector or sorry we used to have the agricultural sector everyone was was working in agriculture for a long time this is sort of think of the old old english countryside Mm -hmm. uh, but that's largely been automated. And then we, then we moved to industry. Uh, so everyone was a factory worker. And then that got automated. <laughs> and now everyone moved to service. And service is starting to get automated. And there's no other place for people to migrate to. So um, either we start really talking about a post-scarcity economy, or we just let people starve to death on the street. And, and people are just not ready to be like, well, you know, maybe, maybe we don't, maybe we should just keep doing what we're doing and give people dumb jobs instead of moving forward. Well, clearly the answer is to make America great again and, and roll back time to the time of GeoCities when everything was fine. That, um, that is a good, good point. Hire all those people to be HTML coders anyway. All right. So, uh, all right. And that's, um, so loot. I heard about this and I felt like this might be the end for me because the first blockchain thing that actually made some sense loot is uh essentially snow crash you know the the uh the punk cyberpunk future what this guy did it's like um crypto kitties he made this thing where he just makes possessions that you might have in like a world of warcraft game like you know uh amulets and clothing and stuff and then you can buy them on the blockchain and there is no game to go with it but they're expecting somebody will invent a role-playing game to go with it and then you just trade these loot possessions around the way you trade magic items in World of Warcraft, and it's all on the Ethereum blockchain. And people are enthusiastically trading these and bidding them up. And there are some that are made that are free, and there are some that cost money and are therefore more prestigious. And it's they're essentially NFTs, but it is just an activity. And it kind of reminds me of the uh, those cyberpunk books where the guy in real life is just sort of a homeless bum with no job, but in the cyber world, he's like a hero saving the world and everything. And uh, the square people say, you're wasting your time. But he said, there's this whole cyber world where important things are happening and I'm big there. And I think that's, uh, anyway, this is the, uh, people say this might be the next really hot thing in on the blockchain. And I think that's the stuff that is like openly, plainly a game makes a lot more sense to me than the part where they try to pretend that this stuff is like serious finance. But anyway, I remember CryptoKitties were, were really an instructive example because they made these things, they traded them, and as soon as they got popular, the blockchain crashed and couldn't trade them anymore. And the Ethereum blockchain still has not dealt with its uh, flow problem. So I think the same thing will happen with these. Nothing can get beyond like the early prototype stage on the blockchain before it freezes up because you can't handle the number of transactions. And there's always an innovation coming like in six months to fix that, but it never gets any closer than that. Anyway, loot is the new hot blockchain thing. And so Liz has got Proton Mail, which you use, I think, right? Sure. Yeah, a lot of people do. Um, so this was kind of a, a story that's been going around um, the security and privacy community this week. Um, 
Proton Mail uh, ended up having to um, comply with uh, police requests from the Swiss police to provide uh, IP addresses. And um, uh, essentially this, this French activist group um, had uh, uh, been tracked by the police and um, they, there was a demand, there were demands made to Proton Mail to, uh, to uh, cough up the IP addresses, which had been um, accessing the account that the, that the uh, group was using to communicate. And um, this, well, this is problematic because one of the, one of the ways that Proton Mail markets itself is saying, we don't log your IP address. We're very user privacy, focused, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, uh, you know, their, their response is, well, we typically don't, but when the cops tell us we have to, if, if there's merit to their request, then we have to comply. But, uh, you know, if, if there's no merit to their request, then we kick back, kick it back and don't uh, respond. But uh, one of the things that I thought was very interesting about this article was that, uh, in 2017, um, they had gotten uh, 13 rec information requests from the Swiss police. And then by uh, 2020, they had gotten three uh, over 3,500 requests in yeah. that year. And uh, so uh, they, they realized that a lot more people that they wanted to keep tabs on were using this service. Yeah, and I remember the same thing happened to Hushmail years ago. Yep. Uh, and uh, yep, that's why, I mean, a lot of people say, you know, you really shouldn't be using email if you want this kind of privacy. Although what the other thing they said, which made sense, is, you know, we do have an Onion tour site and you sure. could have used that and then we really wouldn't know anything about you. <laughs> that's true, but, you know, that's not exactly fail safe either, you know. Uh, if oh, I, don't, cops... I don't think the Swiss could get in. The only people who can get in is the Americans. Right. Well, maybe. Yeah, because it's run through American military servers mostly, <laughs> which is pretty hilarious. Yeah. But anyway, um, yeah, well, and people are freaking out, but they say, you know, Proton Mail really did all they could. Right. And and any, you know, I, I feel like there's just really you can't have much of an expectation of privacy using email anymore, or, you know, if you ever could. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately. Yep. All right. And so Caitlin has got a telescope on the moon. Yeah. So um, uh, salon.com has an article written by uh, Nicole Carlos. Um, so uh, about a year ago, I'm imagining, um, the Arecibo telescope uh, collapsed. Um, and now, and that was one of our biggest. Uh, tell us uh, radio telescopes uh, that we had access to um, and it's it's not going back up uh, so there is a plan over at this place called the National Aeronautics and Space Administration um, never heard it, of them yeah yeah the NASA I don't know anyway the, they are looking into something called the LCRT project or the Lunar Crater, Crater Radio Telescope Project and they actually already invested about half a million dollars into research and development. And the idea is to build a radio telescope in a new crater, this time not on Earth, but on the far side of the moon. And this will be a radio telescope uh, looking at wavelengths that are 10 meters or longer. And so you may be asking, well, why would you want to put a radio telescope on the moon? Like what's the advantage? Um, well, there, there are two advantages. Uh, first, there's the Earth's atmosphere, which plays havoc on, especially on longer radio signals, which is how uh, radio operators are able to send radio waves um, all the way ac uh, across the Earth sometimes. Uh, the idea is that the radio waves bounce off the upper atmosphere, the F layer, uh, you know, and come back down, and they come back up, and they come back down, and then just refracts the radio waves, and you get a whole bunch of distortions. Um, on these longer wavelengths. Uh, and so you would ideally want to put it in space and all the best telescopes are in space. Um, the atmosphere just is a terrible, even for light. <laughs> um, but the thing is when you're dealing with uh, large um, 
wavelengths of light. Um, you need very large antennas uh, and, and a very large dish. And you can't just like throw that onto a rocket and just be like, okay, we're done. Um, like you can with something like the James Webb Space Telescope. So the idea is to build it in a crater uh, on the far side of the moon, which will be shielded. So the far side of the moon is always facing away from Earth because it's the moon is tidally locked. Um, and it would be completely shielded from all the radiation coming from us on Earth, um, as well as you know, just having no atmosphere uh, to, to block it and having a, a stable platform on which to build. So they could you know, build it in sections and sort of build it up and get things ready to go. Um, and yeah, and I, I think this is going to happen eventually. I don't know if it's going to happen soon, um, but the idea of putting a telescope on the moon, on the far side of the moon, especially something that's looking at these longer wavelengths, uh, will be um, something that happens. So, is there a lot of radiation that comes from us here on Earth? Um, it used to be more, actually, uh, but yes, and there's also Earth's geomagnetic field, uh, which can also play havoc on on radio signals as well. Uh, but definitely, uh, we are beaming stuff into space, uh, AM stations, FM stations, um, you know, uh, or even, you know, GPS satellites, you know, are, are sort of beaming everything around. So, you know, you, you get the quieter, the better. Yeah. But now we have a lot of like cable and fiber optics, so we don't use so much bra broadcast. Yeah, it was it was initially a long time ago. People thought that we were going to start using more and more radio signals uh, because that's how things started off in radio. Is that we started building little antennas, then bigger antennas, then bigger antennas, um, and then people sort of thought, well, gee, if there's like aliens out in space, then certainly they're like broadcasting so much stuff. We better start looking for these aliens. Uh, but what ended up happening is that we actually became more efficient with our radio signals. So instead of having one giant transmitter that transmits around the world and all this stuff. We now have these like little routers and little cell phone towers dotted all around, which just gives off little poofs of power here yeah. and there. And so we're actually more, more efficient than where we were like 50 or 70 years ago. Yeah, yeah. All right. Fair enough. So we're back to Irvin with you block origin. So this is a nice uh, article from Firefox on you block origin and all the little things you can do with it. Uh, for those who don't have it, it's a great add-on that does block ads. And it, it can do more than just that. Now, for example, there's a eyedropper thing that you can choose a certain element to permanently remove it. Uh, there are uh, different pop-ups, different things that you can change to, a, a, to any site as you need. It's a, it's a versatile tool. Uh, it's just a little, uh, a little look into uBlock Origin rather than just install it and done like the uh, article I had earlier. This one dives a little more into what you can do with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I used it now and then. I think now I'm using uh, um, Brave, which essentially has it built in. Yes. Yeah. All right. And then I've got. Uh, I saw this article. Uh, which people started arguing about and it, it caught my attention. They, this person says, what you're going to do as a doctor is you're going to ask people if they're vaccinated and then decide if they have a good reason not to be vaccinated. And if they don't, then to hell with them. Just let them die and give only bother treating the other people who deserve treatment. And, you know, this is not medical ethics. <laughs> the fact is 90 percent of everything that sends you to the hospital is your own damn fault. You ride your car with no seatbelt. You drank a bunch of booze. You smoked for your whole life. If a doctor's going to start not treating you because you're a damn fool, then that's, you know, Hippocrates handled this long ago. You don't go there. You know, like a priest and a doctor are not there to judge you. They are there to help you. And if it's your own fault, that's really not the issue right now. <laughs> yeah, though, I could see the other side of this. And interestingly, I, when I read this article, when it came out and had a discussion about it with an uh, anti-vaxxer friend who yeah. actually agreed with it. They were totally fine with that. And I was like, okay, that's kind of interesting. I wouldn't have expected that to be your position on this, but they they actually fully agreed with it, which really surprised me. I didn't expect that. But I mean, the one part I thought that did make sense is good old triage. 
Now, one thing I've heard, like people in Houston doctors saying, you know, I have people say goodbye to their family before they go on the ventilator, because now with Delta, when they go on the ventilator, they're just going to die. Mm -hmm. They never come off. I said, well, in that case, why even bother putting them on the ventilator? I mean, if, if in that case, you might as well, there's a thing called triage where you look at people, you say, well, I can't save this guy. So we'll just treat the next patient instead. If you don't have any treatment and they're just going to die, then that makes sense to put them in the back of the line if you have a line, but that's not a moral judgment that they didn't have a good enough reason not to take the vaccine. That's just a good old fashioned medical judgment. I can't help this guy. So here's where the moral quandary becomes a bit more interesting. Um, if this were, like you said, Sam, I guess smoking is a bad idea, but a uh, bad, bad example. But um, if, if you're not wearing a seatbelt yeah. and you accidentally get into a car crash, that's your own damn fault, but you're only affecting you. Now, when you're talking about the vaccine, you're talking about public health safety. Mm -hmm. And so if you're not taking the vaccine because you know, you're know you a fool, let's be honest here, yeah. um, you're putting a lot of other people at risk, you're putting a lot of other people in the hospital. Uh, you're kill you've potentially killed other people yep. and are gonna kill other people in the hospital. Um, and so this idea of not treating people who are putting other people at risk or well, who could potentially, yeah. Well, now, if you're going to kill other people in the hospital, you're, that means you're not having proper sanitary precautions in the hospital. I mean, the whole point of the hospital oh. is you're supposed to be able to let sick people go in there and they don't infect each other. Isn't that kind of the whole deal? Well, yeah, but, you know, I think part of it here, too, is that uh, people are dying from preventable stuff because there isn't enough room in the hospital. Well, you know, that is my, I hear the right wing Twitter getting madder than hell. It turned out that the famous story about that was fake. It was a famous story well, came out like a week. Which one? Ago. Rachel one. Maddow. Yeah, the one that hit Rachel Maddow. Uh, it was, well, I think, uh, Oklahoma or something where they said gunshot people are dying because the beds are all full of COVID people. It turned out to just uh, be totally fake. Well, but I actually read a different one about this guy who died because he had, uh, he needed his gallbladder removed right. and it went septic. Right. Well, I mean, and there, all right. But in a case like that, that is when doctors are supposed to perform triage. And logically, I would say you would like want to free up the bed by not bothering to treat the COVID patients that you can't save anyway. But there's no need to even go into the moral argument and you're not going to make any friends over there. I mean, because then it just turns into a political argument. Now you say, well, you know, you're a Republican. We don't want your kind in here. <laughs> and you can't, you can't be going there. That goes nowhere good. Well, I mean, yeah. the thing is, there's a lot of Republicans who have taken the vaccine. Okay, let's not pretend like this is strictly mm -hmm. like a Republican issue or even, oh, yeah. No, I mean, it's just, is. I mean, you, you don't, I, I realize that there's a high correlation between crazy conservatives who mm -hmm. believe in conspiracy theories and um you know uh, uh this sort of anti-vaccine movement but there's also a lot of liberals who are just refuse to take anything that's not natural and and it really it's it, you know that it does not come down to politics when it, when you're dealing with these these issues it's a public health issue well, yeah but my point is a doctor is only supposed to look at the medical issue they're not supposed to be judging on anything else right and I, I mean personally i agree sam i don't think that the, the doctors should be making any any public health decisions about not treating people who are whatever that's not their job to make public or, health or, decisions or any moral decisions about how we don't like your lifestyle we won't treat your kind here like you know you aren't even supposed to be like in a war refusing to treat people of the enemy army you know right. you just treat everybody as much as you can uh you're here to uh <laughs> you know you're not here to judge them. Right. I, I agree. I agree with your position. I'm just saying that, that it is it is a bit more more complex than a lot of than just, you know, oh, you're doing this to yourself. We're not going to treat you. I mean, this this really is a public health issue and they are hurting other people by not taking the vaccine. That's true. They are. But even that is not really the doctor's issue when it's time to treat somebody. I agree. Yeah. I agree. All right. Anyway, I mean, what that is, is maybe they want to, like, convict you of a crime later, but that's not the issue right now. <laughs> Anyway, um, so Liz has got uh, tattleware. Yes, so uh, a, there is a rise in the um, 
in the in the usage of uh, tattleware or bossware, which is uh, spyware that's essentially meant to keep an eye on your employees and uh, make sure that they're doing their job. And uh, you you know. The, the the one that they explained uh, that the one that they um, just the, they opened up in the art this article discussing is called sneak and the description of the way it works is <laughs> is something uh, every minute or so the program would capture a live photo of the employee and his workmates via their company laptop webcams. The ever-changing headshots were splayed across the wall of a digital conference waiting room that everyone on the team could see. Clicking on a colleague's face would unilaterally pull them into a video call. If you were lucky enough to catch someone goofing off or picking their nose, you could forward the offending image to a team chat via Sneak's integration with the messaging platform Slack. That sounds like my personal hell, uh, and I think it is for a lot of employees. Well, they should give you a bounty payment for everybody you catch goofing off. Then we'll have a um, glorious utopia. I'm sure that that's coming. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's just kind of insane because... You know, we've got a, a, a glut of middle management in this, this country that has no idea how to manage or uh, manage their teams that they're in charge of. And so that's how you get shit like this because but they, they've coasted along until the pandemic by uh, using the butts and seats model where the amount of time that you spend in the office is the, the main indicator of uh, how hard or how good of a worker you are, which is ridiculous. And to me, an indicator that you don't know how to judge your employees or your teams based on work product. Yep which is really how you should be doing it. Well, you know, this kid, my great grandfather was an efficiency engineer and he would go to factories and time people with stopwatches to figure out which people to fire. And that's where this kind of thing came from. How many bolts are you screwing in per minute or something? Well, and I have, uh, you know, one of the, one of the other stories that I had considered was how uh, Amazon California has uh a legislation in the works right now uh, to target Amazon because they're implementing this sort of productivity worker uh, software against their workers. And I've seen it even in um, places where you would think it would have no business. Like, for example, you know, oh, let's uh, let's gauge the effectiveness of these teachers based on how many emails they send to the students. I mean, it's, it's just completely asinine and not an indicator of the quality of the product or how much work you're getting out of the employee. Well, especially in teaching, there's a huge problem with how you measure it. Yeah. We don't even really agree what the goal is mostly. Well, yeah, maybe that's a bad example, but, uh, you know, keeping track of, of someone uh, sitting in front of their computer for eight or nine hours a day and making sure that they're sitting there uh, typing away and not ever picking their nose um, is probably not the best way to ensure good outcomes in your business. Yep, yep. It is kind of Orwellian. <laughs> Really, what you want to pay attention to is uh, the amount and quality of, of work product that that employee is generating. That would make more sense, yes. All right. And so, Caitlin, the Germans want to make the phones last for seven years. Yeah, that seems a good, a good amount of time um, before technology gets out of, out of date. Um, so, of course, phone manufacturers are always trying to push people to upgrade. And one of the ways they do that is, of course, planned obsolescence. So they put a product on the market and they say it's going to be good for X amount of time. And then we're going to just stop giving updates and stuff. And then you're at risk for getting hacked or whatever. And so you're basically forced to upgrade. Um, now, technology does naturally become outdated over time. <laughs> and there is a certain point where people probably should upgrade their phone. And I'm looking at my... Uh, 
iPhone 6. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, but I ideally, you should use your phone for, you know, as long as, as you can, as long as it still works. It's, if it, you know, you're just creating needless waste if you go with these corporate models of planned obsolescence. And so German, the Germany has an idea where what they're trying to do is legislate that if you're going to put out a phone in their market, uh, you have to support it for at least seven years. Um, now, I don't know if that means you get the latest iOS upgrade or the latest Android upgrade for seven years, or um, you know whether you get the latest uh, operating system for like four years and then another three years of security updates. Uh, but Germany wants to make it so your phone can at least last uh, seven years moving forward. And I think that's a good step forward. I think it is too. You know, I'm an Apple user. I'm an Apple consumer. Um, but one of the things that really irked me the most that the company has done is when they removed the ability to upgrade their laptops. You know, you used to be able to buy a MacBook Pro and uh, say you just buy it with specs that are fine for the time, but then you know, you still want to use that laptop five years down the road. Okay, you can upgrade the memory, you can um, swap out the hard drive, it's easy. Um, and it keeps those machines running and out of the, you know, e-waste, uh, the e-waste uh, stream a little longer, but they have, they removed that capability and um, now you're just stuck with whatever you buy at the time and it is what it is. And then they want you to buy another one instead of keep keep those machines in use, which is, I'd really love to see a trend um, towards exactly what you're talking about, Caitlin. Yeah, the other thing too, especially with, with laptops, um, is that the hard drives, even the SSDs, have a very limited lifespan. And so when you have things like the hard drive on the laptop soldered straight onto the board, that means that computer literally can't last forever. Um, it's it's going to die. And the only way to fix it um, is to unsolder the chips and then find the exact, you know, same chips, <laughs> um, you know, 10 years down the line um, and then solder it back on. And I got to tell you, these chips, a lot of the times, especially the the um, uh, the hard drive chips, they're either going to have pitch widths that are so small that you literally need like microscopes to solder it on, or they're going to use ball grid arrays which require like a thousand or $2,000 machine in order to get that, you know, soldering job done. And it, it's just not feasible for, for most people to just keep their laptops just running, let alone updated and, and running well. Um, but. You know, I, I get the feeling neither of you people are going to jump on Windows 11. No, I'm, I'll download Windows 11 as soon as it comes out. But um, how would you say such a thing, Sam? <laughs> <laughs> I did. I jumped on Windows 11 even before it was a beta, but I'm using it as a target. Exactly. All right. Yeah, no, Windows 11 will be annoying, but it'll be fine. I'm not one of those people that you know wants to stall. I don't, the only Windows I would not use was Windows 8 for obvious reasons. But um, other than that, I don't have a problem using bad versions of Windows for a while. But what would you use Windows 8 as a target? Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't even use this as a target. <laughs> Windows 8 was very important for me. It motivated me to switch to the Mac. It served a good purpose. So I said, all right, uh, why am I putting up with this? Why am I tormenting myself? I should just buy a Mac. Yeah, that was the only time I was like, no, Windows, the old version of Windows is fine for now. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> My students in tech support were making money um, upgrading Windows 8 back to Windows 7 for people. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I was, and Windows 10 was fine, and Windows 8.1 was was fine, but Windows 8 itself was like, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Microsoft does that a lot, but they're not, making not really. I mean, like even like even Vista, uh, Vista wasn't that bad. I mean, it was. But Microsoft makes a lot of horrible products that fail, but then they have a lot of hits that pay for it all, like Azure. Right. Well, I mean, usually the way Windows goes is they have a good version and then a crummy version, then a good version, then a crummy version. The only version that was like super crummy that I would not touch was Windows 8. But all the other crummy ones, it's like, fine, you know, it's just a stepping stone to the next version, which will come out in three years and it'll be like a thousand times better. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's it. And it being Tuesday, we'll be back on Friday. 
Let me see if I can find the right button this time. 